All right. Good. So Gnosticism should have no place among us, even though it is plenty of evidence around us. Now, the contrast, and Kolb talks about this, he talks about materialism actually undermines God's plan for creation, and with it, individualism. Now, he puts individualism down here in this category. I would put individualism underneath what I call autonomy, doing my own thing. And I think that's where that belongs. But, see, materialism is also an affront to God's plan for creation because what you're really doing is you end up worshiping the, the, the material instead of the creator. And so the alcoholic is worshiping the feeling that he gets from the alcohol, and that becomes his God. It's his driving force in life. So it takes the good thing and it ruins it. This is a common theme. You have God's good creation being misused. It's not bad inherently. It's the misuse that is the problem. Again and again and again, you'll see how true this is. So sin takes what is good and twists it so that it becomes evil and not good. All right. Now, the last thing we need to talk about, and this will be what the time we have here, is the whole thing on evolution and how we understand that. Because clearly, if we're talking about threats or challenges against a first article understanding of the world, evolution becomes a big problem. Now, when we discuss the issue of evolution, one of the first important things to do is make sure we know what we're talking about. Is it okay to believe in evolution as a Christian? Yeah, precisely. What are our options here? Uh, micro and macro. Yes. We need to distinguish between microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution recognizes that things change over time. People today are, on the average, significantly taller than they were a couple hundred years ago. We know that. All right? Now, is that an evolutionary change? Sure. We'll call it a, a microevolutionary change. Okay? There is a, an, ad, an adaption happening where people are just getting taller. So it happens. And so you have a bird that changes its colors of feathers over time. Does that happen? Sure. That can happen too. No big deal. All right? We would say these are examples of microevolution, whereas you have adaptations or changes within species. This is not a problem. And to try to say that doesn't happen is really denying what's going on around you. Macroevolution is a very different thing altogether. Macroevolution is the teaching that species evolve into other species and that you're going from a lesser to a greater. Okay? So a move from simple to complex and a move up the ladder, okay? a progression forward. That's the idea of macroevolution. And so you have the generation of species, one species generating a new species. That would be macroevolution. What's the big problem with macroevolution? What are some of the problems with macroevolution from a Christian first article standpoint? <coughs> Where does it start? OK. So here you're kind of getting at it from an epistemological question. How do we know what we believe? How do we know what's true? Let's do that first, and then we'll get into some of the nitty gritties of this. You've often heard it said, probably, by people, that it takes as much faith to believe in evolution as it does in creation. Have you heard that said? There's truth to that. Because evolution is founded on in a, a certain epistemology, right? And its epistemology it claims to be, in other words, how does it know what it knows? It's claiming to do scientific research and studying things and looking at things, and that's its claim. But the problem is, it is based on the idea that, yeah, species can jump. Have they ever been able to prove that? No, haven't. The missing link is still missing. Haven't found it. Haven't found it. Even though, even though scientists will claim this, these bones prove this, they just have not found a missing link. There doesn't exist. And so evolution is based on many presuppositions which lack scientific proof. And yet, people accept it, and they buy into it. So there is a 
faith commitment, even on the part of somebody who's believing macroevolution. So really what you've got going on with the difference between the belief in creation and the belief in evolution is, in a sense, warring belief systems. That's really what's going on here. It's in a, uh, warring, warring belief systems. All right. What are some other problems then with evolution? Yeah. The big one that I've heard since, I mean, I always had a problem with it, but what, since I've arrived here on campus, um, the idea that um, death came before um, or during creation as opposed to afterwards. Okay. Why is that a big deal? Yeah, I'm with you, but go ahead and run with this. Because it's, death is a consequence of sin, and evolution is a denial of that. <coughs> All right. But death was required for the, for the evolution to take place. Yeah, exactly. It's so one of the big problems. Theologically, we have a, a major issue because we understand death as being the wages of sin. And we, would, uh, we believe that before sin came into the world, there was no death. And so evolution is a problem. Now, the other issue is you got all this supposed evidence for it. You know, you got these species that no longer exist. You got the Eohippus running around. Well, he's not running around anymore. Um, and so you have all this proof that the, the evolution has come up with. And so what is the, a real popular thing among Christians these days to try to resolve this? Say like the six-day creation was six eons. Or sure. So six days doesn't mean 24-hour periods. And so did you do this in your Hebrew class? I mean, your Old Testament? What do we mean by days? Okay, that's another one. So in Hebrew, the word for day is yom, which on occasion can mean period. And so people say, ah, that's it. I found my way out. So six days just means six really long periods. And so what happened is God created using evolution. And this is known as theistic evolution. How do you explain that sun setting? Well, all right, we have, a, we have many problems with this, all right? <laughs> At least I do, all right? But theistic evolution is very popular right now, especially among people who want to say they are good Christians, they believe, the, they believe God's word, but they also take science seriously. And I am told that even in our Concordia system, we have people who are rather tenaciously teaching theistic evolution. I haven't checked it out, but I'll take the reports at face value. So I'm told this is out there. The idea that theistic evolution is the way that we can harmonize science with theology, and everything's okay. And those, those who are espousing theistic evolution usually do it in the name of, hey, we don't want to be another Copernicus, a Copernicus fool. And so what are they referring to? No, the whole flat earth, earth being the center, heliocentric, geocentric, understanding the universe. In the Middle Ages, it was taught that the earth is the center of the universe. And then Copernicus came along and said, no, the sun is the center. And that solves everything. Everything's revolving around the sun, not the other way around. And what did the church say? Can't be. Because why? Because the earth was created first. Yeah, that was part of it. The bigger issue was, no, in the Bible, in, where was it? Second Kings or something like that. It's the story about when the sun, well, you got a couple of stories. One is when the sun goes back a few steps, okay, and on the staircase. And so obviously the sun is moving and not this earth. And the other thing is when the sun stood still when Joshua was fighting. And so the sun stands still. Obviously that means the earth is in the center and the sun is moving across. And, they, and so the church, the Catholic church said, Therefore, the sun is the center, and Copernicus, Copernicus must be wrong. Now, later on, of course, Copernicus was validated and vindicated, and the church said, okay, he was right, when we are, we're sorry, we were wrong. And people say, well, obviously the scripture was wrong. Now, I'm not ready to grant that at all. 
Because I would say it's much simpler than that. Joshua wrote down what he saw. And is he trying to be a scientist? No, he's just writing down what he saw. The sun stood still. That's what it saw. In fact, you and I still do this today. Tonight, if it clears up, and I go out this evening and I watch the sun sliding down, what am I going to say? Sunset. The sun is setting. In reality, what I should say is, ah, the earth is rotating around the sun and <laughs> spinning on its axis, and I see that the, sun's cur the earth's curvature is making the sun appear to disappear behind the eclipse, the, the edge of the horizon. When in fact, the sun is just standing still. And well, no, not really, the sun is bolting outward from the center of the universe as well, but that's a different issue. In fact, we're spinning around the sun, and it just appears that the sun is setting. It's not really. We don't say that. I know that. But when I talk about the sunset, I say, the sun is setting. Or, look how fast it's dropping. It's not going anywhere. Now, I think the same exact thing is going on in Scripture. And I hear this argument from theistic evolution jerks, I'm sorry, I mean individuals, who are trying to say, you know, we don't want to be as, we don't want to, obviously the church was wrong with Copernicus. No, the church was made the mistake of running too hard with their understanding of how they're going to interpret what it means by the sun standing still. Joshua is describing what he saw. So then the people say, ah, that's what Moses is doing. Moses is just using a myth, trying to explain what is unexplainable, and that's what, that's what we, have, we have to understand this. Well, the big problem is this issue of death. It creates big problems. Because if you're really going to buy into a theistic evolution, you've got to try to somehow explain how you can have millions of years of death before Adam and Eve even arrived. And to me, this is a huge theological problem. Yeah. I just need to clarify from things that I've heard from previous experiences. Is theistic evolution different or the same as trying to come up with natural ways for things like the flood? Or, I mean, I could see how they can intertwine, but sure. could they be separate? They can be separate. OK. They can be separate. I mean, you don't have to have everything the Bible talks about doesn't have to be a miracle. Right. You know, and so, you know, when there's the, the sky grew dark, oh, maybe it was an eclipse. You know, you don't have to have a, a divine intervention for every, everything described in the Bible. That's true. But the problem with theistic evolution, one of the problems is you've got this issue of death. And I know they can do some creative things to finding, well, what does death really mean? And you start playing games with that. But the other concern I have with theistic evolution is it's really just kind of, I think it's granting way too much to the science of this day. And that's where we're back to this intelligent design thing that was talked about, the ID. See, intelligent design is making us say, you know, it's not as clean cut as the, as the evolutionists will have you believe it. And there's not as much evidence in their favor as they would want you to think. Because so much of the evidence that they marshal cuts both ways. And it can really cut the other direction as well. It's not as a clean cut. So with Copernicus, it was pretty clean cut. He had the math. He had the observations. There it was. With evolution, we're led to believe it's all clean cut, and you're just a fool to believe it. But it's simply not the case. They've got so many holes and so many questions. So my, uh, my personal take on it is this. I think the jury needs to be out on this thing a little bit, and we need to be a lot more cautious in how we embrace it. And I think theistic evolution is selling the farm way too soon. In other words, we're capitulating to the science of the day and trying to accommodate it when we shouldn't. We don't need to. We don't need to. The science of the day isn't even decided for sure what it thinks. So we should really stay out of the fray. And that's what Cole was talking about. Kind of just back off of this thing and teach that God is the creator and that God creates man uniquely and specially and that man is responsible for the fall. This is what Scripture gives us. And if we lose the creation and if we lose the fall, then we lose a lot we lose a lot. Because if we lose the understanding of the fall, evil and the brokenness of the world, everything is takes on a different nuance entirely. And so there's a lot at stake here. So I, uh, I urge great caution when it comes to how do you come to terms with this stuff. I don't think you need to say anybody who talks about evolution is obviously out to lunch and then, you know, stick your head in the sand and be a kind of a fundamentalist. You know, the Bible said it. So do I believe in a 6,000-year-old earth? I don't think I need to believe in that. But I also don't see the need to have a billions and billions of years old earth because the only reason it's billions of years old is to give them time to get everything done. I don't need that either. 
what I've come to conclude personally, here's where I've come down on this. When I was in college, I was wrestling around, and I kind of like the yom thing, being long periods. It gave me the time I need. Now I have to just figure, what's the, what's the hardest thing for God to do? Six days? Fine. That's what he did. I don't care. So I just, six 24-hour periods, that's where I'm at now. And I accept it not because, well, that's what Genesis 1 says. Well, yeah, it does. But I accept it simply because, why not? I mean, it's, it's there, we're here. God created it. So I'll, I'll abide by that. And I don't have to try to make everything else fit. How old? When did it happen? I don't know. Long time ago. Millions of years? Probably not. Hundreds of thousands? Yeah, probably. I don't know. You know, enough room for some ice ages? Yeah, I suppose. But, you know, where can those fit in? There's all kinds of rooms in the biblical record for all kinds of periods of time. You know, even the genealogies, there's all kinds of space. So I'm not too concerned about it. But did it happen with God creating a special world and creating Adam and Eve on the sixth day? Yeah. That's where I'm at. I'm thinking about this. I heard the argument that God, when he designed it in six days, he built in a history. Yeah, that's a common argument, too. He, put, he, he built a history into it, and so he created the earth with the memory. Maybe. You know, some people say, well, then he's being deceptive. He's misleading us. Ah, I don't know if I would believe that. But, you know, so he put the memory there, and he made it look older than it was. And he could have done that. No, sure, he could have done that. I don't, whether he did it, I don't know. That's not part of creation theory. Not this, no, no. That's, that's really a move of a creationist. Now, here's the other concern. So theistic evolution, I don't have a lot of use for that, quite frankly. But I also don't have a lot of respect <coughs> or interest in a creationism sort of thing, what's known as creation scientists, because these guys get kind of weird on the other side, and they're out trying to prove everything all the time. And, you know, everything they explain, they, they're a young earth kind of a thing, and the flood cover, counts for everything, and they've got explanations for everything, and their science gets a little bit shoddy as well. The big concern is this. We need to be careful that we don't start trying to play on the field of the evolutionists. Because if we do, we will always lose. Because you can take the science and you can take the data and you can twist it around almost any way you like it. Creationism twists it their direction. Evolutionists twist it their direction. And I would argue the better thing to do is to let the, the science continue to on. We'll explore, we'll learn, we'll decide, we'll un unearth new things. In the meantime, we'll keep on teaching our theology correctly God is the creator, and God is in control. And that's what we will hang on to. Yes? Would it be correct to say that evolution is, the, the macro evolution is a, a, a type of deism? Yeah, it, it very much is. There's a fascinating book that probably some of you will, I think we'll probably still end up reading in Systematics 1, called um, Darwin's Proof, a guy named Cornelius Hunter. And he argues that one of the reasons that evolution really took off was an, an attempt to try to explain evil in the world without making God look nasty. So it, uh, very much a deistic idea. So God stands back and just lets things roll on and it happens without him. Very, very true. That is very much a part of this. Um, so that, that's a concern. Um, yeah, well, you see, there are other problems, too. You know, you guys, you physicist people, the second law of thermo th thermodynamics is everything basically falls apart, right? All systems entropy? entropy, what's that? All systems come toward entropy. Yeah, all, all, all uh, the, the basic fundamental law of entropy. So, and this is illustrated as easily as your kid's bedroom, okay, <laughs> or maybe your bedroom. <laughs> so if you simply live in that room for a month, and you never put any effort into straightening it up, in what, situ what, what will it look like at the, at the end of a month? Yeah, it's going to be a mess. Stuff strewn everywhere. You have to continually be putting positive effort into restoring it into order. Because entropy, just everything falls apart. You drive down the interstate and you see the old falling apart farmhouse. Why is it doing that? Well, that's what happens. It decays. The shutters fall off. The paint peels. Roof caves in. The whole thing just falls apart eventually. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So, in other words, left to themselves, everything unwinds. Evolution says exactly the opposite. Evolution says, left to themselves, these organisms get more and more complex, and they advance and grow, get better and better. It's the exact opposite. The physics itself, the basic law of physics says, no way. It doesn't work. And this is one of those things that a macroevolutionist just, just doesn't want to talk about that. That their, their whole system is based on we're getting better and better and better and progressing. 
based on what? Everything else that we experience in the world, everything else we study in the world, tells us the exact opposite. Things fall apart. Things unwind. Things unravel. When you started the discussion this morning, um, you asked us about Martin Luther's definition of God, the thing mm -hmm. that we are most focused on or involved with, we spend the most time with or care right. about the most. The thing that's most important to us, yeah. One of the big things about contemporary science in Western culture is that um, the scientists like to criticize the church for being dogmatic. Yeah. And But there's, there's a really cool website. It's called um, The Theory of Everything. Uh -huh. And it challenges all contemporary physics based on the dogmatics first presented by um, uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Mm. There are things that he assumed that everything is based on, like, for instance, the reason one body um, rotates around another one we call it uh, orbit <coughs> is because, well, if you take a string and a rock and you swing it around, it does that. Okay, there is no proof whatsoever of any kind that planets orbiting around one another act like rocks on the end exactly. of the strings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're onto something fascinating here. And this is, this, I, I, I love this stuff because <laughs> gravity itself is one of the most basic things we talk about all the time, but nobody knows what it is. It also runs contrary yeah. to other laws in Newtonian physics, yeah. like for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So what action creates gravity? Right. Right. There isn't one. Yeah, exactly. There is something that's you see, there. We, we, um, we, we talk about gravity all the time, but nobody knows what it is. Is it a magnetic force? Is it electromagnetic? Is it waves? No one knows. It's, it, you can't measure it. You can see the results, but nobody knows what's going on. What and how is you know one planet influences another one through what? What medium? There's there's just they just don't know. It's fascinating to me. You know these things we just take for granted, and we think the science is so you know so far down the road. Oh, we're clueless on so much, and we just we just call it like we know what we're talking about. Well, we don't have a clue. Gravity is how it travels through time and space. Yeah. It affects planets that are like kajillions of years, uh, light years away in the same way it affects ones that are really close. Yeah. And at the same exact instant. And yet it's a force in which there's no force expended, but it keeps going eternally. Yeah. It, it absolutely contradicts right. everything about that's Newtonian right. physics. Exactly. And right. So the thing is self contradictory, yep. but that's not dogmatic. Yeah. You see, now that's the other thing. We have, in our culture, elevated science to the level of God. And scientists are the gods of our culture, especially medical scientists. I mean, we look at them as having all the answers that are going to preserve life, and we treat them with the kind of dogmatism that used to be, you know, only in the church. But it's clearly in our culture today. And you stick PhD behind somebody's name and call them an expert, and everybody falls all over him like he knows what he's talking about. And trust me, they don't, okay? They don't. You know, they, they're just a fool like anybody else making guesses. And so we, we've got to be a lot more cautious in why we're believing what we're believing and what we're willing to accept. Now, does that mean that every creationist argument for where dinosaurs came from and, you know, all this kind of stuff? No, I'm not willing to buy that either. We don't need to be fundamentalists about this. But let's be a lot more cautious in selling the farm to theistic evolution. We don't need to do that yet. We're, we're giving up way too much. Okay? And the parallels between Copernicus and Darwin are overdrawn. They're, they're, I don't see the parallels at all. I don't buy it. All right. Other questions or comments? So the first article is really very significant because it establishes the world in which we live. And it establishes God as the creator and this creation as being his good world. The first article is also significant because oh, it's first. We don't start with Jesus. We start with God, the creator. And the first relationship that any of you have with God is your creation, not your baptism. Baptism was number two. So the first relationship you have with God is the fact that he created you, and you're his. And you live in a relationship with him, whether you know it or not, whether you want to or not. And as nat you know, sinfully born human beings, we don't want it, and we fight against it. But it's there. And so... Baptism is calling us back to where we're supposed to be. And Jesus' work of redemption is restoring the first article world, putting creation back how it was supposed to be. We start with creation, and we go from there. That's why creation is really an important doctrine, 
And that's why it's so fundamental to everything else that we do afterwards. Can maybe draw in something here to make a connection I should be drawing. If, uh, if God is our creator, and that's our first relationship, then God is therefore in relationship with everybody, whether they're believers or non believers, uh -huh. which is fine. So, um, I'm losing it now. I lost it. Okay. It Something like that. Anybody else? <laughs> Any final thoughts? All right. Tonight, if you have the time, dig into some reading some coal. We're going to be picking up with about chapter four is where we are. If you want to kind of get your gauges here. And if you read, you can have even more brilliant questions to ask and know what's kind of going on. And we can have talk about even more fun things farther afield. So do your best to do some of the reading in it. And we'll crank forward and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Have a good evening.